Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Digital Disruption Podcast with my colleague Chris Williams and myself Pete Gatenby. Welcome. This week's topic, Chris, is all about low-code, no-code, deployment, development of, of web applications or applications in general. Take a look. Yeah, general. Indeed. Um, so first of all, what is no-code, low-code development? I think the best way to describe it in the context of um, home buying or well, the home buying market and the, and, the, and the conveyancing market is to understand that there are platforms out there that will enable you to enhance or develop a piece, an application, let's just say, uh, by way of using a, a little bit of code technology or none at all. So if to give you an example, you've got environments such as email marketing platforms. Most people can familiarize themselves with those. Um, so it's an easy one to draw as an example, whereby you could create a series of action steps that can happen yep. uh, based on a particular trigger, i.e. somebody opens an email that you've sent to them and that automatically puts them into a particular sequence of activities where they get a number of other emails. They might even trigger a phone call from a colleague or something like that. That can be programmed up in a no-code environment, i.e. there's no actual programming user utilizing computer languages in order to do it. I'm talking very simple terms now. Mm -hmm. Whereas on the low code side of things, there are similar applications out there that will enable you to build an application by drag and drop GUI interfaces, building up certain things, and then be able to enhance that by leveraging a small amount of coding skills to do it. So that's in, uh, in brief and in short what it is. Why is it relevant in this industry sector? I think as we've come into 2024, one of the we talked about this actually in, in, in the last podcast, it's sort of one of the trends. I think one of the trends most definitely that we're going to see in terms of digital maturity and ex exponential growth in areas of this market is the ability for organizations, whether you're a lender, law firm, vendor, broker, whatever you are within the home buying ecosystem, you've got the ability to leverage these types of low-code, no-code platforms in order to test hypotheses and build applications quickly in order to have quite a significant impact and if you can do that quickly it's going to enable you to move to a scale or, or enable you to move to scale quicker um, and there's lots of i guess use cases where you can start to apply and deploy this and i think it's highly relevant today for organizations to be one aware of it to how they can go to utilize it because you don't have to be a big organization to do this this is it's, it's actually accessible to to smaller organizations too hence the no code bit so there's lots of opportunity in this as well. Is it ready for the financial services space, the home buyer space? Is it at that level now? Because if we think about building websites, right, just mm -hmm. the label, just a minute. Yeah. You see Wix, right? Click, that's no code. Yeah, no like code. A, like you build a website without knowing how to code. But an enterprise wouldn't necessarily use Wix. Is, are there no code and low code platforms that can be deployed in anger within the enterprise, especially in the home buying space? The short answer to that is yes. The obvious next question probably will be from people, what are they? I, I, I'm happy to kind of go into some of them in a little bit more detail, um, potentially, but the short answer is yes. Um, we like to obviously remain agnostic. You know, we're not affiliated with, with organisations in, in that regard, and nor do we want to be, because I don't, I don't think that would be, uh, necessarily be right. But there are platforms out there, yes, which organizations could be using and um, i mean you give a really good example actually about you know a website if you think 20 years ago we could actually even use no code then to you know pull sites together i mean i think back to my days at freecom you know we had environments platforms that were doing that way back then um you know back in 2002 2003 so the world's moved on dramatically since then and today there are uh, if you look, if, if organizations say look to their processes, their business processes within their organization, look to specific areas whereby there's some, whereby there's bottlenecks, for example, and thought, what could we do to improve that? A lot of businesses perform those sorts of exercise, but what they then tend to do is either enhance an existing manual process or optimize an existing manual process. And if they don't have an incumbent or uh, 
current technology people around them, they might look out to the market and say, what what exists out there for me to go and buy, rather than perhaps looking into a different lens and say, well, I don't necessarily need to buy something, software as a service, don't necessarily need to build something and scale it up. Is there a platform out there that would enable me just to make some tweaks to something like this? And there are plenty of platforms out there to help you do that kind of stuff. And I think there's a big opportunity for organisations to begin to educate themselves around those platforms. So where do you see there being the biggest opportunity within the home buying space? The biggest opportunity? Oh, that's a big question, that is. But I'm not going to pick out one particular big thing um, or in one particular vertical within the market. But let's talk about opportunities generally across the ecosystem that might be there. So again, whether you're a lender, a law firm, a vendor to this market, broker, whatever, one of the big topics, if you like, of talk that um, from last year and again into this year is definitely collaboration. You know, we, we, people talk about collaboration, I think about the project I'm working predominantly on at the moment. A big part of that is collaboration across the ecosystem. Um, now, collaborating really efficiently and effectively a great way to do that is to utilise exercises that we've spoken about before, such as assessing your value stream, but doing that as a collaborative exercise, figuring out where the where there's uh, bottlenecks, blocks, whatever else, and then looking at that together to say, well, how could we fix that issue and let's put a pilot in place? Now, you can do that as a small organisation. So say you're a small law firm, for example, um, who... You know, no secrets, been tough times out there for them. They might want to increase margin. How do we do that? Ne- not necessarily by cutting lots of overhead, but actually how do we become more efficient? How can we become more efficient at scale? You know, these are ways to do that in those sorts of organisations, but you can do that in a you know much bigger law firm. You could do that in a big lender. So in terms of answering the question of what's the big opportunity I think that is the big opportunity for for, for, all, for everybody to be doing that as individuals internally, but then looking externally to the process, left and right of, of, of who's involved with you in the process and coming together and collaborating around that and running those sorts of exercises because there's lots of stuff you can do. There's lots of great collaborative things that happen across the industry. And of course, you know, having been involved in a number of them uh, last year and, and a number that are coming up in the next quarter, these are the sorts of things that we're definitely going to be doing to be looking at you know how, how do we enhance this stuff but that would be my genuine invitation to people look internally first number one get together around and you can do this over lunch and learns by the way like 45 minutes mm-hmm. you think about some of the exercises we have to have to and do run sometimes you, know, you can get a small group of people from within the organization and say right take a look at the problems that we're experiencing jot a few of them out uh, come up with some ideas of how we could fix those problems utilising technology, but don't be held back. Imagine that we've got access to the best technology capabilities. The magic wand technique. The magic wand technique, exactly. You could wave the magic wand. What does that look like? Just explore the art of the possible. And when organisations start to do that, you start to kind of you know build up that um, that bank of culture around innovation and, and, and challenging the status quo. And then start to look, well, what low-code, no-code capabilities are out there that could possibly where we could test some of these ideas and knock something together? Because you don't always need access to top-tier talents necessarily yeah. to do that, even at some point. But don't let that you know hold you back. Historically, what we've seen across industries, not just in the online space, but across industries, is the choice to solve a problem mm-hmm. with technology has been find something off the shelf that's a SaaS solution that serves or solves the problem that you're trying to fix. Or you go to the opposite end of the spectrum, which is you build something from scratch. And now what we're saying is there's this hybrid in between, which yeah. allows you to build something without having to build it from scratch because you're using building mods that already exist. Yeah. Interesting. Definitely. And I think just segueing there to more towards vendors, there's a lot of vendors that service this industry sector with great products and services from, you know, the front part of the conveyancing and, and home buying process at the front end all the way through to decision in and, and, and beyond into the conveyance and, and, and the settlement and lodgement at the end. You know, there's there's players, vertical players, technology vendors that have come in and, and built some great stuff in all of those, uh, each of those vertical type areas. 
But there's an opportunity for them as well because no doubt they're looking at their own capabilities. Yeah. And we, we talk about AI a lot, obviously. And I think in this space, there's a lot of talk around AI um, in kind of pockets of what AI can do in terms of its capabilities. And I think I, I, from, what, from what I'm aware of anyway, certainly none of the conversations, I nothing that I've seen publicly, nobody's really talking about that perhaps from a vendor capability of, well, actually, how could we be utilising some of this stuff to provide different um, operating functions within the you know within the stuff that we've already built and scale, and how can we scale that into this sector as vendors to kind of you know almost do more with what we've got and better improve security for the products that we've deployed to market improve the communications uh, almost in, introduce machine learning into these capabilities to enable these guys to actually pre-configure this stuff themselves mm. and be able to code on top of it to enhance it I mean you know I'm being they're uh, quite extreme in the examples there, but all of this stuff, it's there now. And we're going to see, in my view, as I said in our prediction session, I think we're going to see this exponentially start to grow as more and more organizations from within the ecosystem actually get on top of their digital maturity and think, at, you know, think, start to think differently. And you can see, you can see the, 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 the changes in, in, in across the industry, I think. Absolutely. And if you look outside the industry, many of the startups that are springing up now, mm are uh, doing so at pace when they're integrating AI mm -hmm. with these no-code and low-code tools yeah. to build applications, whether that's web, mobile, wherever it might be, uh, and deploying them quick, learning quick, and, and, and iterating quick. Now, if we start to take the application and take that learning into the home buying space, in the industry that, let's, let's be honest, is, is not the fastest moving when it comes to innovation, something becomes quite powerful. Yeah, and I think that that that, there's that that change is absolutely there about innovation, and there's the momentum is there, and the desire to to move quicker. Uh, I think in the last, well, yeah, since the start of the year, I think there's probably more than four or five conversations where I've been involved, whereby the same two North Star comments have been made: remortgage in a day, sale and purchase been a week, you know, moving these things along quicker. It's not going to happen overnight, yeah. but a stepping stones to get there. This is the sort of stuff that's going to enable it. And, I, and that's the, I guess, the message partly in, in this session where we're talking about low code, no code. In yeah. summary, what is it and what you can be doing? What is it? Think about websites and knocking them out in five or 10 minutes because you're just, you know, dragging and dragging things across. That's no code. You can enhance that with a bit of HTML. That's low code. Think about that in your organization. In where, whatever the wherever you sit within the, the ecosystem, you've got business processes, you've got functions that take place, you've got integrations. Yeah. What could you be doing to improve those where the slowdown and blocks to increase efficiency, keeping the customer at the heart of it? Here's some of the stuff in low code and no code that you could be utilizing to really accelerate your digital yeah. initiatives this year. That's the big message, I think. Absolutely. And I think the other, the other thing that, that I'm seeing when I'm talking to CTOs and, and the like, is they're being asked to do more with less. Yeah. Budgets, let's be honest, we look at the economic climate at the moment, budgets being tightened, but the demands of the business on the technology team that exists and the product team that exists is higher than ever. There's more stuff to look after as well. And yeah. I think when you look at the enterprise estate, it's, you know, how, how do you how do you maintain the estate mm. in, a, in a best? Now, for every, it's diff every estate, it's going to be different. But yeah, from the conversations internally around that, whether it's with yourself or others, they all seem to be coming back with very similar things. How do I do more with less and scale? Yeah, absolutely. And while keeping up to my same security standards and trust and it's maintaining the integrity of the brand and everything else that goes with it. Interesting. So what do your brands within the home mind space need to equip themselves with? What skills they need? What will teams they need? What people do they need? I think it's important to probably break that down into small, medium, and large, because if you're a larger enterprise, you'll have access to more resources. My invitation to those to enterprise grade organizations would be to uh, take small incremental steps. Don't, don't go big bang yeah. as you traditionally have done in the past uh, and to literally task squads or people within existing product teams to look at these improve I mean a lot of these organizations will have this level of stuff going on anyway but to look at perhaps maybe where the blocks are in that 
um, for, for those organizations, but equally for as an enterprise to maybe reach out and start to cross collaborate with others within the ecosystem to see where we are, what they can do. I think in that mid range um, setup where perhaps you're, you've got your own technological capabilities, but you're very much hybrid in the sense that you've got your own, maybe you've got your own product advancements that you've got within your organization, i.e. you've digitalized key component parts of your own business processes. You're integrated into third party systems. You do quite a bit with software as a service in, t- in terms of procuring it in um, and you enhance that. Maybe it's like law firm capabilities and you're enhancing your, your CRMs and your case management platforms and things like that. You'll have a, uh, a, a reasonable level of digital maturity sat within your organization. A similar thing, I'd be inviting them to go and look, right, just set up maybe once a quarter sessions where you're examining mm. process, looking at where you can make improvements. But critically, as part of those exercises, doing some sort of scorecarding where you sort of say where we're going to see the, the, the highest value. And with the mid-range companies and the enterprise organisations, once you've gone through those exercises, you're probably likely going to be in a position and I know you'll love this one, where you can run hackathons and you can actually start to throw some resource around this, but utilizing some of these capabilities, yeah. in, you know, okay, you're not dev in IP, but let's prove a concept, it's testing stuff, it's getting stuff out there. Now, again, culturally, a lot of this stuff, a lot of this exists in small pockets within the ecosystem. I think it could exist in more areas. I think the, 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 the more we talk about this, the more we can raise awareness of it, the more it'll it, the more it'll encourage the, the collaboration around it because this stuff can be done at scale and input and, and, and much quicker so that's be for those two groups I think then as you look at a smaller group if you're a small business and you don't have your own internal tech resources you don't have a, 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 a developer or access to a couple of devs or anything like that you're very much a, an own a managed operated organization with maybe a couple of directors and you know 10 plus people or, 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 or more, but you don't have tech resources. You can do the same minus the hackathon type stuff. So when I say the same, let me be very clear, Get all get together, whether that's just for a couple of hours on a Friday afternoon or whatever it is, look at the business processes and say, where could we make improvements? Let's spend 15, 20 minutes, Sharpie pens and some post-it notes, where could we make some improvements? And then solutionize around that, waving a magic wand, exploring the art of the possible. If we had access to loads of, te- loads of cash, loads of tech resources that could build anything we wanted quickly, the technology would just resolve some of these issues. What, what would that look like? What would be the impact to the customer, to our business? And put, put in there things such as, the, big, the bigger organization will have this anyway, but for small ones, they might not think like this. But put, put in there things like, what, is this going to generate us new money? Is it going to be a new revenue stream if we fix this? Is this going to be an efficiency to organize our organization, therefore increasing our margins, which is great, so it's an efficiency thing? Or is this going to be um, uh, increase our revenue because it's a, a, a new product or service that we can take to market? Whatever it is, is it, is it efficiency? Is it um, a new product or service? Or is it saving us, you know, saving us money in some way, which I guess is efficiency as well? You know, think about it in that regard. And then once you've done that exercise and you've sort of waved the magic wand, take it away and say, well, and go and research the market. It won't take long just to say, well, is there anything out there that would enable me to do this? And go and have some conversations, whether it's with some tech companies or some consultancies and just sort of see what, and there might be something out there and have a play with it. And so it's that smaller group, that's what I'd be doing because they could then quite easily start to find new ways of doing things. The other thing for them is, as well, is that they're not sat on the sidelines waiting for a vendor to come and solve the problem. I'm not suggesting that that's what happens necessarily, but I, I, I know it does in a lot of instances. But at the end of the day, you can proactively make steps, even if you've not got access to technology talent, to leverage technology to do some pretty impressive things in your organisation. And don't underestimate what you can do because all you've got to do is have a process to enable you to do it and kind of have the mindset to think, do you know what, just by utilizing a few frameworks, we can test this, enable it and go and make a real significant impact. And then when you're coming into the collaboration space or being invited to 
to, to, to industry events to talk about things. You're actually talking from a level of experience where you can come and talk to vendors and organisations and say, hey, could you solve this problem by doing that? And then all of a sudden that might help you. And when you're thinking in that way, it's a very it, that's a very collaborative mindset, it's an innovative mindset. And, and that's really going to advance businesses over the next 12 to 24 months. So that's a good method to be having, I'd say. Absolutely. So you've touched on different platforms in the in the marketplace that are available to all businesses, not just mm-hmm. enterprise level businesses. Should we perhaps talk about a few of them? Just give give a few examples of, sure. of our favourite ones in, in certain areas. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a start for 10 because I've been playing with this one a lot recently, but Bubble.io, you create a web app in minutes. And I know that's quite a simple one, but within hours you can have quite quite a nice, powerful web app. Um, other ones, ones that have been around for a while, Zapier, Zapier, depending on where you are, what you say. Um, obviously, Zaps, people talk about Zaps all the time. The my is no-code API integrations. So you can connect platforms and these pre-made Zaps really to, to integrate between pretty much anything, as well as anything your heart desires. Um, another one that I've been playing around with recently is uh, is Bolt Press. So to draw towards a, a close, then let's talk about use cases. I think, given your exposure to not just, I guess, platforms, but actually defining and developing use cases across this sector, what are the use cases people should be looking at? Yeah, absolutely. And look, these, and we could talk about platforms, of course, we could, but there's no real good way to recommend a, a platform for anyone to live out first from some problem, right? Um, but yeah, let's talk about the use cases. And this often comes up when we run hackathon-esque workshops that you you tell us about a couple of minutes ago. Um, but really, we start to look at areas of technology that these platforms serve. So the first one, we talked about web application development. We, we mentioned the weeks by name, yeah. but that is a website. But you can all there are also platforms that fall, develop full web applications that could help you deliver anything from a CRM through to a project management tool all the way through to an a, a e-commerce website if you want to. You, there's, there's, a, there's a myriad of in that web application space. And then there's the mobile app space where you can pretty much build a, a mobile application, whether that's brand focus, whether that's social media, like whatever it might be, yeah. and pretty much from scratch with click and, click and drag again. Then you've got, well, okay, what do these web applications talk to? How do they talk to our systems? And so there's integration no code, low code platforms as well that help you build or develop it or, or deploy. Sorry, not develop, deploy yeah. APIs or integrations uh, between systems that might already exist, uh, existing databases, and the web application that you might have. Or, and then, then bring you on to the next one, which is the databases. There's tools out there now that you can literally build and deploy databases, whether that's locally. Uh, on your machines or even in the cloud and and, and, and uh, an enterprise level and you can build these out quite quickly and then you've got the other end of the spectrum and it's on the front of everyone's mind at the moment um, around AI and using chatbots chatbots and, uh, and that kind of thing and they're done I mean those startups that, that are low no code and um, training modules for natural language processing are springing up all of the time and a lot of them are uh, a lot of the good ones that I've played around with and been involved with uh, our own full service mm. um, and actually have elements of of the uh, databases and the integrations uh, there ready to go. Um, so yeah, it, it really depends upon what, what's the problem trying to solve, what, why, what would we use, why do we use it, and then, yeah. and then go into the use case and then talk with yeah. us within that. I think that's really helpful, actually. I think to close on this, the other thing to note would be put time aside religiously to test and explore this stuff. Because I think in terms of culturally, we talk about culture mm. uh, in organisations and the importance of having a good culture. We talked about it in, in, in one of the more recent podcasts. Actually, this culture of innovation and testing and experimentation, I think it's missing. What do you think when we do maturity assessments inside of businesses, we look at this mm. and there's always this uh, response to it. Yeah, we're really innovative and we've got all this stuff and we've you know, you know, yeah. we've got all the bells and whistles and everyone walks around in t-shirts these days instead of, you know, pressed shirts and whatever else. It's kind of like, well, that's pretty, that's cool. But, you know, you know we've to kick, tick the cool box. But in terms of actual yeah. persistence around innovation, if you can just put aside, even if it's just once a quarter, like literal sessions whereby no matter how big or small your business is, you've got pockets of people just given a bit of time to explore the art of the possible. 
and you do that persistently and consistently and you give them the freedom to do it, if you can do that and create a framework around it, for me, that's what's going to massively help, not just accelerate what it is that you're doing and where it is that you're trying to get to, wherever you sit in the ecosystem, but actually it's going to protect your position from external and internal threats. Mm. And I think that's a, a big one for me to finish on. I, I could not agree more. Becoming delivery focused rather than discussion focused. And the amount of times that I have discussions with our clients about not having meetings about the meeting. Yeah. And actually that's like rather than have the four weeks of meetings, if we'd have just spent that time delivering a delivery on set. They've tested perhaps using no code, low code in those four one hour meetings, we'd probably be a lot further towards the solution than we than we are today. And that's a real live discussion that we we have with clients because it's waste opportunity, right? I mean, then yeah, on the bigger scale, yeah. And I think this is the important things for the you know for smaller organisations out there. Bigger organisations have, have tend to have that because there's a lot more um, not necessarily resistance. I think that the, the attitude's there to, to to want to move quicker, but you know, change is difficult, right? Transformation yeah, is hard, and right. it takes time. But for the smaller organisations out there. Therein lies a huge opportunity because you're much more agile. You can move quicker. So, yeah, I've enjoyed that. There's some really good stuff, hopefully, uh, for everybody to, to, to absorb and, and take it. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us uh, for another episode of the Digital Disruption Podcast brought to you by Nova Strategy and Consultant. Um, thanks to myself, Pete. And from myself, Chris, and we'll see you again. We'll see you soon in a couple of weeks. Thanks a lot.